Good morning, Atomic Church. How is everybody this morning? For those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, I'm Pastor Sarah. I am the care and women's ministry pastor here at Atomic Church. I get the privilege of preaching today while our amazing pastors are out on a little sabbatical at Victory Conference getting refreshed. I want to ask you guys to do something for me today. I want you to pull out your phone and I want you to share the message today only because we are getting some worship songs today that were so powerful on Friday. If you did not get an opportunity to come to or, or watch live um, Wednesday or Friday, sorry, worship with the word on Friday, you missed out because it was an experience like I have never felt before. I, I was on the phone with them for, I think, a grand total of like an hour talking about Friday's Worship with the Word. And there are two songs that we are singing today that are so powerful that I think they were given to us for a reason. So what I want you to do is go on your Facebook, share today's message right now so that people can hear this music. And then what I want you to do is I want you to put your phones down. I don't want you messaging. I don't want you commenting on um, Facebook Live to the people that are coming in because Pastor David will be in the back doing that for us. I need you guys to really be in the presence of the Holy Spirit while these songs are going on because we have said many times before that worship is the time of preparation. And when we're distracted by commenting on, hey girl, I wish you were here or stuff like that, while we're doing worship, we're taking away from the opportunity to be in the Spirit's presence. So these songs are going to rock this house. And if you're not here, you're definitely missing out on a live opportunity because it's amazing, more amazing in live than it is through Facebook Live. But share the story, put your phones down, and enjoy worship. First, I want you to turn your attention to the screen as we have a little message for us. Hey, family. Hope you're doing good this morning. We are still in Tulsa at Victory Conference, and we're having an awesome time here. Getting really filled up with the Word of God. How about it, Pastor Don? Yes, we're having a great time. You know, obviously, you know by now we're not going to be there this morning, but I tell you what, Pastor Sarah's going to bring a great word this morning, so enjoy it and know how much we love you, and we'll see you next Sunday. Yes, we'll see you guys real soon. God bless y'all, and we love you so much. Church, let's just go ahead and enter into the presence and just worship our Father.
in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work in. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work in. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work in. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemies. You come back and you call it my victory. 
is just so powerful that no matter how far you might feel from God he's always there that it's nothing that we could ever really do to ever make God love us more because he just loves us so much that even in our depravity, even in our sin, he came down and died. Now, if you think of everything that you've ever done in your life that kind of makes you go, man, I really screwed up there. God loves you, even regardless of that. Or you could think, man, I really hurt this person, I really hurt that person. How could God ever, doesn't matter. He still loves you. So we're going to go ahead and sing that chorus and sing it with us, but really just think about the words that you're saying. Hallelujah. You have saved me. Let's go ahead and sing that chorus. said you're always there waiting for us just to say the words you're, you're not angry while you're waiting you're not disappointed while you're waiting but you're happily patiently waiting and we thank you for that God silent 
heights of my fears Even the worst of my mistakes Are miracles in the making A miracles in the making By your strength
And can we sing your word is settled in heaven? Start from there because I feel like um, they need to understand that it is so. It's settled. It's already been done. It's it's not something that needs to be done again. It's not something that um, you have to correct or fix or um, prove to the Lord. He did it already. His word was settled in heaven. He spoke and it is so. Can you do that? Okay. stripes you are healed with one touch you are made whole he spoke and it is so he spoke the words came out breathe the words on you and it is so father god thank you for reminding us that you've already done all this for us this is past This is something that was already laid out before us. The foundation was already there. All we have to do is surrender. All we have to do is receive the gift you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for always being the person in my life that was my provider, my protector, my strength, my shield, my fortress, the Lord who is my redeemer. It's in your son's name that I praise and glorify and thank Jesus Christ. Amen. Our worship team is going to get some stuff put away. We're going to put two minutes on the screen so you can meet and greet, give some people some love. We'll get back to you in just a couple minutes.
Well, good morning again, Tomic Church. We are so glad that you guys are here to uh, enjoy some, man, amazing worship. I don't know if you guys, ex- yeah, yeah, oh man. I don't know if you guys experienced what I experienced, but I was having a serious Holy Spirit moment up here, bawling like a baby. And that's okay, because those are things that um, are raw and real to the Lord. And so I don't care if y'all were watching or not, I don't care. I'm going to have a Holy Spirit moment. So that's what I was having. Um, We're going to do tithes and offerings right now. And I want to tell you a little story about something that happened uh, last week, actually. It started last week. There are four ways to give. You guys can do text to give. If you don't know how to do that, you can see myself or Pastor David after church, and we'll explain text to give. You can also, um, at the beginning when you walked in the door, there were envelopes. You can fill those out, put in the bucket on your way out. You can mail it in, or you can also, what's the other one? Uh, Do it online. Sorry. You can do it online. Um, So this last week, while... We were having a, a word from Pastor Mark, and, you know, Pastor Donna was talking about ties, and she was talking about how we have to get out of our comfort zone. She was saying she had heard from many different sources throughout the week that we need to get out of our comfort zone. So she asked everybody. She asked me, actually, to put the bucket up here on stage, and she asked everybody to just pray about how you can get out of your comfort zone for the Lord and, and honor him with a tithe or an offering. And I was in the back. And the Holy Spirit's like, well, you got cash in your purse. Now, if anybody knows me, I don't carry cash. People have stolen my purse way too many times to carry cash in my purse. Because I can get money back from my credit cards, but if they steal cash, can't get cash. So I don't carry cash. But it just so happened that I had cash in my purse for a different reason. And I was back there and I was listening to her. And the Holy Spirit's like, you got cash. And he didn't give me a dollar amount. He's not like, here, you know, add this in there. Like, you know. That's all you need. He just said you got cash. So I came up. I Actually, I walked back and got an envelope. Came up, got cash out of my purse. And I had already given my tithe for my paycheck. This, this would have been an offering. But um, and an offering, in case you don't know, a tithe is your 10% off of your very first fruits. It's before taxes come out. It's before you pay all your bills. That's what tithe is. Offering is just that much more that you just want to love and honor God with, that you want to support something specifically. It's, it's a love, an extra beyond what is, um, what the Bible asks you to do, what God asks you to do. So I came up here and I put the cash in the envelope, walked up, dropped it in the bucket, didn't think anything of it, like not a big deal, just put it in there. Later during the week, I actually had the opportunity to go back to my actual physical office for the very first time. I have not been in the physical office. I've been doing work from home for the last whatever amount since March. I don't know, five months, Um, four months, something like that. And I had not yet been been back into my physical office. I went back into my physical office. The owner of the company happened to be there, and he gave me an envelope. And I I was just like, oh, thanks. And I started to walk on, and he's like, you might want to look inside before you thank me. And I didn't know at the moment, but he was being sarcastic. And so I started to open it, and I was actually supposed to be going in with a patient at the time. So I was, like, trying to usher the patient on in my office. And he's like, can you just hold on for two minutes? I'm her boss. It's okay. And he comes in my office with me, and I'm just like, okay, why are you in my office? This is very awkward. (laughs) I started to open the envelope, and it was this long letter about two years ago, right after I had started, six months after I had started at that agency, was Christmas. And they wanted to give us a Christmas bonus. But then finances fell through. There was some issues, and they weren't able to. And all of us who were there, there, and currently now there's only four of us that are left from that original thing. But all of us that were there were like, okay, never mind. It's not going to happen. We're not going to get our Christmas bonus. not a big deal. And so none of us even, you know, gave it a second thought. Well, I get this envelope, and it's a very long letter explaining that it has weighed heavily on their heart. And they felt that now was the time to give that Christmas bonus. And I had a two $100 cash bills in an envelope. Wasn't expecting it. Had no inkling that that was what's going to happen. 
I'm telling you, when you do what the Lord calls you to do, when you serve him and honor him and glorify him, he will bless you above and beyond what you could possibly imagine. I had no idea I was going to get $200. I got my hair done. You know, that was awesome. So I was all excited. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so, yeah, move on. Uh, Sidetrack. Uh, so I just want to pray over our tithes and offerings because I know that when you pray about this and you let the Holy Spirit talk about what he's going to do for you and you glorify and honor him with your tithes and offerings before even knowing what was going to come, he is going to deliver something amazing to you. Father God, thank you for always blessing us, for always giving to your children in abundance, for filling us up past the full, for giving us more than enough. Thank you, Lord, that we can always receive from you if all we do is praise and honor you. Thank you, Jesus, for being the king in my life, for allowing me to do things in your name, and I honor you with my tithes and offerings. In Christ's name, I pray these things. Amen. We're going to do something today that we do every week. It's our confession. I'm going to ask Pastor David to come up here. He's kind of looking at me all awkward right now. And I want you guys to stand up. If you want to hold hands, you can. It's not required. But we're going to say our confession as a way of declaring to the Lord what we promise to do for him, how we promise to live our lives. I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. My heart is open and my mind is ready to receive because God is not finished with me yet. My best days are right in front of me and I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. Woo! I have a hanging on my wall. Uh, it's a cute little board that has a saying that I got as a birthday gift from someone. And I love this hanging that um, it's actually mounted right above my TV in my living room. It says, grateful, thankful, blessed. That saying has been on coffee mugs and t-shirts. I've seen it all over the place. And I used to just think it was just a cute little saying. But when my husband hung it up on the wall, mind you, we had it in our house for a few months before I decided to actually hang it up because I'm very particular. Like, I have places that things need to be. And I'll pray ahead. I mean, I pray ahead. I, I've joked about this, but I truly do pray Sunday morning what I'm going to wear that day. So, I prayed ahead about where the Lord wanted me to put this sign. So it just kind of hung around my house for like two, three months before I actually put it up on the wall. But I had Pastor David put it up on the wall, finally, when I decided where it needed to be. And I remember the first time I passed by it thinking, there's something special about this phrase. And each time I'd pass by it, I would think, man, there is something really special about this. I wasn't quite sure what the big deal was, but I knew there was a big deal about this particular saying, grateful, thankful, blessed. A couple of weeks ago on Wednesday, I was doing Wednesday's Word, and I was talking about how we are to be kind to others, that it's our job no matter what to be kind no matter what comes our way. His Word gives us life and it revives us. I challenge the listeners to try to show kindness towards others instead of complaining. I challenge them to be the kind of Christians that don't complain or be, get bent out of shape, to be something different that others can see. I explain that God's word is where our revival comes from. It's where our peace comes from. And it's where our contentment comes from. I told the listeners 
to praise him in the morning, praise him throughout the day, praise him at night, praise him in the storm and in the joy. I have been on a huge mission recently because of communication that I had with the Holy Spirit. He said, my people have forgotten all that I have done for them. And that they're blocking the blessings that he can manifest in their lives. That's what he told me. Well, recently, I've been in this deep study for the his story chronological Bible study that I'm doing on Exodus. And during this section of Exodus, God's talking about how his people have forgotten all that God did, all that he was able to bless them with. And they're even complaining about not being taken care of. While I was reading that, I remember thinking to myself, what is wrong with these Israelites? I mean, I was like, (laughs) you guys are stupid. Like, (laughs) I didn't understand why they were behaving the way they were behaving. I really did the whole, you know how when dogs, um, when when you're with your puppy and they kind of look at you like, huh? That's really what I was doing when I was reading this, going, huh? Like, that doesn't make any sense, Israelites. Why are you whining? Did you not see how he provided manna from heaven and gave you pigeons every night and, and um, broke open a rock so you could have water? Where is your mind? I couldn't fathom why they were acting like that. And so I was festering on it for a while, and the Lord said, we are the Israelites. The Lord said, we are the Israelites. He said, it has continued throughout the generations. People have forgotten what I have done for them. They have forgotten to be grateful, thankful, in reverence to me. In Genesis 17.3, it says that Abram fell on his face in reverence. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody fall on their face but it's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful to see that they have gotten to a point where the the only place they can be is down that low because that's where God needs them to be. Abram fell on his face in reverence. In Genesis 28, 18 through 21, Jacob gave honor to God. There's great detail about he honored God in that section. God gave Abram, well, at that time, Abraham's generational family loads of blessings because they honored God. They were grateful and thankful. The problem was the Israelites stopped their blessings. They kept blocking their blessings, their multitude of blessings. They blocked the receiving of them. They were not content with what they had, and they stopped praising him. When I was a child, I lived in an extremely poor house. My daddy bounced around from job to job to job, from one job to the next, because he had made mistakes as a teenager and a young adult that caused him to have a different lifestyle than I'm sure that he would have wanted. It actually caused him to spend time in prison. Due to his choices, his consequences followed him. When you make a positive choice, I've said this before, when you make a positive choice, there's a positive consequence. When you make a negative choice, there is a very real negative consequence. And typically, those negative consequences follow you for a while. They hinder your life. They do things that make you feel worthless. But in reality, you made that choice. Nobody else made it for you. And just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that you get to get out of the consequence. If you made the choice, you get the consequence. Well... My daddy's consequences followed him so much that he wasn't allowed to vote. 
He did not have a college degree. The only kind of jobs he could find was what society called the lower class jobs. So it was hard on us. That's why we were, you know, considered poor. My mom was a babysitter full time, and she actually babysat a, like a slew of kids. It was like probably illegal, but um, she babysat a whole lot of kids in an effort to purchase one class of college credit per semester. So she actually managed to get an associate's degree as a registered nurse by paying for it outright cash, and it took her five years. That's how long it took to get just an associate's degree. But she did that for our family's sake. However, that did not happen until around junior high, which you guys know as middle school, which is a whole other sidetrack, but it's junior high, is when she got that kind of status to where we didn't feel so poor. But up until that point, most places we lived were about 800 square feet. Does anybody understand or comprehend what 800 square feet is? I mean, my house right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, love, but I think it's 2,500 square feet. Is that right? Yeah, 2,500 square feet, two-story, four and a half-ish bedrooms, I think, three baths, three-car garage. It's a great house. Our, like, biggest living space was about 800 square feet growing up. I can't imagine as an adult squeezing into 800 square feet. That reminds me of, like, a trailer. Oh, Amanda probably could manage that. Where'd she go? <laughs> That's, that was our life. Like, we were stuck in that tiny, tiny space. And we didn't have, you know, the kind of things that other people have. Everything we had was either secondhand or it was, like, thrift store finds that were like where clothes come to die. I mean, I'm serious. Like, you know, there's, okay, there's Savers and there's Goodwill. And those were thrift stores. But I'm talking about the thrift stores where if it didn't sell at Savers or at Goodwill, then they took it to the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army would try to sell it for like six months. And then if that Salvation Army didn't sell it, which was in the in the, like, middle class area of Phoenix. But if it didn't sell there, then it went to what was considered the lower class part of Phoenix to the second one down Salvation Army. And it would stay there for about six months. And if it didn't sell there, then it went to where I lived, South Phoenix. And South Phoenix, you could literally get, like, a whole suit for a dollar at Salvation Army. I mean, this is the stuff that... (laughs) I remember going... One time, I don't even know if he realizes it, but when we were dating, he needed a tie. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to throw him under the bus. I went to that Salvation Army as a young adult because I thought it was a cool kid memory. Like, I, I didn't necessarily think it was a poor thing. I didn't get it until I was older. But I remember going there as an adult going, I'm going to go check out that thrift store. I found some amazing ties for a nickel each. So he got like four ties. (laughs) And I didn't spend but 20 cents. Like, it was awesome. So... Anyways, it was where clothes came to die. Um, We got our food at food pantries or at the state office. I don't know if you guys have ever gone to the state office, but we went once a a week to get a box. They gave us a box of food. And in that box of food, there was this, it was called government cheese. Did anybody ever experience government cheese? Woo, Miss Sharon. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, Brad, I'm telling you. Like, government cheese looked like a block of Velveeta. That's what it looked like. But it was more like powdered cheese mixed with water and then put in a gelatin mold. It was the funkiest thing ever. It did not, did not taste like Velveeta. And I remember thinking to myself as a kid, why do all my friends get sliced cheese and I have to slice my own cheese? That doesn't make any sense. They get, like, they're individually packaged. I didn't get that. Like, we had this big old hunk and block. <laughs> and it was, it was nasty. But we had that as our food pantry. We also went and got bread 
at the bread store. The bread store, I don't know if they do anymore, but they used to sell bread that was expired like a, a couple days past its expiration date. And we would purchase that and we got bimbo bread. Has anybody ever had bimbo bread? Oh, goodness. Like, <laughs> anyways, I'm not even going to, go, going to go into that. But we got bimbo bread. And that was our eating when we were kids. Our entertainment was something totally different. Like, one year, it was 120 degrees outside. Again, I lived in Phoenix, 120 degrees outside. My daddy was a janitor at a, uh, I think it was a high school. And he used to have <clears throat> these industrial size garbage bags. I mean, you could fit a whole body in them. Anyways, huge garbage trash bags. He brought one home one day, and I, I think I was like seven. I don't know. I was little. Um, I was like Levi's age. And he brought one home. He and one of our family friends took like the dumpster that's out by the side of the house. I don't mean like, I don't mean like the big square dumpsters. I mean like the big trash cans that are about like this tall that the trash guy comes and picks up. He went and got that, put the big trash bag in it, filled it with water, and my sister Jamie and I went swimming. He literally put us into the trash bag to swim. It was 120 degrees, y'all. I was seven years old. I didn't really care. I was hot. Like, it did not matter. That's, that's, how, that's how poor we were. We weren't, we weren't wealthy enough to actually go to the city pool. Um, we also had days, like two or three times a month, I think I've shared this with you before, where we went to dump sites and the local dump site, this was when you could go on the property and you didn't have to pay like $6 to dump things or whatever. But we would go <clears throat> to the dump sites and we would scavenge around. We'd find toys, appliances, all kinds of stuff that we'd clean up and repair. And I mean, I had like some killer stuff from this thing. We also got something um, that blessed our family that I'll share about in a little bit, but blessed our family beyond belief. But this was our life. And in all this poorness, my sister and I were content. Christmas and birthdays were the only time we actually got like real presents. Our stockings usually had socks and underwear yearly socks and underwear. It was like not a big excitement to open up a stocking because we knew. The excitement was what color is it going to be? That was what was so exciting. Is it going to be plain white or is it going to be pink? You know, <laughs> but that was in our stocking. And then under our tree, <clears throat> we usually had like thrift store clothes wrapped up or like our aunts would send gifts to my mom and she'd put them under the tree. We knew they were from our aunts, but you know, my parents were told to take credit for it so that they had some things that were under there besides clothes. We did, however, get one want gift every year, like the gift that I've been dying for all year long. One year I actually got an ALF doll. Do you know what an ALF doll is? Anybody know what ALF is? Oh, you guys are so young. That's so sad. ALF is Alien Life Force. It was a show when I was in the 80s that um, I loved, and I had this doll. My sister actually found one as an adult. Uh, my oldest, the oldest sister, she's probably watching right now, Veronica. Um, she found one at, I think, a garage sale or a thrift store, and she sent it to me in the mail, and it was like childhood memory flowing back because it was like my favorite gift ever. So I have it at home. It's actually in Levi's room. But <clears throat> I got an ALF doll one year. So every year there was one gift that was something we wanted. And never once in all of that did we ever feel anything but contentment. We were grateful and thankful for what we had. We were blessed. Paul says in Philippians 4, 10 through 11, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. There are so many verses in the Bible that talk about being content. 
And I know the word content sounds a little bit like you're settling, like a person is settling. But the Strong's Concordance actually defines the Greek word for content as sufficient for oneself, strong enough, or possessing enough to need no aid or support. So it actually says that we have enough, and when you're content, you have enough where you don't need support. I mean, how great would that feel? Like, I don't need your help with my bills. I don't need your help with fixing my car. I don't need your help with, um, I don't know, making sure everything gets done on time. When you're content, you have no need. The Lord has provided enough to meet all your needs. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God continues to be my Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. We were grateful, my sisters and I. There's a passage in the Bible that has stuck with me over the years, and actually it illustrates my point way better than I ever could. It's Psalms 37, 3 through 5. Psalm 37, 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. We are to be grateful. Get that down. We are to be grateful. <clears throat> My parents did such an amazing job at showing us how to be grateful and thankful. They would point out all the blessings we had through their words and their actions. My older sisters, by the time all this happened, uh, my older sisters had already moved out. There was kind of a huge gap between the older kiddos and my younger sister and I, kind of like with Summer and Faith and Abby, Hattie, and Levi. Huge gap. So they had already moved out. But Jamie and I had a favorite pastime. And our pastime was something that we experienced every night because my daddy found a record player at the local dump, cleaned it up, and repaired it, and it was the coolest record player ever. It was actually a full console record player. I don't know if you guys ever experienced, they're huge, they have huge speakers. It was incredible. And he would do something every night that Jamie and I just got a kick out of. Maddie, can you come up here? She doesn't embarrass easy, so I'm going to make her my guinea pig. Every evening, my parents would put on the record player. <laughs> I'm going to turn it down just a little bit. They would turn on the record player, and they would dance. Now, my parents were not good at dancing. I'm just going to put it out there right now. They were not good at dancing I'm sure if anybody real in public saw this, they would be totally embarrassed. But it was the cutest thing to my sister and I. We got so good at mimicking them as kids that even now as an adult, when we get together, we put on a show for people. My sister was great at daddy. Daddy, her, she was the mimicker of daddy. I could not do daddy. I'm going to give it a whirl. I'll, I'll, I'm going to give it a whirl. But I couldn't do daddy to save my life. My mom, however, I had her down. My daddy, you just stand there. 
stand there, just stand there and look pretty. So my daddy would dance like the life of the party. He didn't have a care in the world, so this is what happened. My mom, however, was on a mission. So what I just did was Jamie. Jamie did that role. Whenever we get together, that was her role. My mom was on a mission. She had a purpose for her dancing, and she was very direct with it. So this was my mom, and I have it down. Are you ready? So if you can imagine what was going on. This is what we did all the time. Thank you, Maddie. Okay, our lovely Vanna. My parents listened to music on the record player every single night, multiple songs at a time. My daddy's was his favorite. I didn't bring these ones because they weren't appropriate for church, but um, Marty Robbins, Johnny Cash, the Oak Ridge Boys, Hank Williams Jr., we listened to all of that growing up and got to watch that growing up. I mean, we were so good. Jamie and I were so good at that. We had a blast. It was every time. I actually just went, what was it? For my 40th birthday, I went to Minnesota. And yes, another Minnesotan. Um, I went to Minnesota where my sister is. That's where she lives. And we have so many cool childhood memories that instantly when we see each other, it comes flooding back. When I got off the plane, well, let me just backtrack a little bit. When we were younger, we lived in this apartment building. There was this little cute little kid. He's like three years old. He wore, you know, okay, tube socks, like way up here with the big red stripes, way up here, like three years old. Tube socks right up here. He had the little short, 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 shorts that there's way, way too short to be shorts. And he had, like he would have a, like a tank top on. And he had, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it's, it was like a little tykes boom box, like white. It had one tape holder. You put a tape, for those of you who are really young, it's kind of like a, DVD, a CD, but it's not really a CD. It, if you ever mess it up, your whole life is screwed. But... Um, It was a little tape that you put in a little tape holder, you push play, and it had this little teeny microphone. And this little boy, we babysat him. We were like seven or eight. My mom was really the babysitter, but we got a dollar for watching him. He'd come over during the day, literally in his short, 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 short shorts with his tube socks. And he'd get his little boom box, hold his microphone, and he'd sing the Eye of the Tiger and bounce around singing the Eye of the Tiger. And this is what he did every single day. I I promise you, he went through four different uh, little cassettes because he wore them out singing the Eye of the Tiger all the time. So when I got off the plane in Minnesota, there's this big, huge escalator that you come down. Like you start way up here. All your people are way down there waiting. Huge. It's like a grand entrance. You're like, oh, like it's me. Anyways, um, we came down this escalator, or I came down this escalator. Here's my sister. This is the childhood memory stuff. Here's my sister back there. All her kids, she's got five kids. They're totally embarrassed. Like she, Jamie does not care. She doesn't care if her kids are embarrassed. Her husband too, he was like hiding in the side. She's in gray sweats and a red bandana around her head and a big sign that says, yo, Adrian. (laughs) Some of you get that. But that was the Eye of the Tiger song. She's literally standing there with her sign like this. I was dying. She pushes play on her phone, and the eye of the tiger was on. And her and I are singing, and all these people were just laughing hysterically because the older people got it. They were all about it. Younger people were looking at us like, you guys got problems. (laughs) But anyways, we got to her house, and her kids were like, do granny and grandpa. Do granny and grandpa. Well, we know what granny and grandpa means. It means... So we did Granny and Grandpa, and we do that every single time because those were funny childhood memories for us. I mean, aside from from doing our dancing, 
We played board games all the time. We spent a lot of time as a family just being together. We didn't have the money to do like amusement parks, stuff like that. Our vacations were going to see an in-law or a cousin or an aunt or whatever. That was our vacation. Um, Oh, I got to catch my breath. That dancing killed me. Um, We were always in church or around church people. We were constantly reminded about what God does for us. Okay, 42. Okay. Psalm 717 says, I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. There's a phrase in the Bible that says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. That one tiny phrase is repeated 26 times in the Bible. God repeated things in the Bible because they were important, and you needed to know that. So whenever you see anything that's repeated, there's a reason God needs you to pay attention. So he repeated that phrase 26 times. It is important to praise the Lord, to be the kind of joyful person that doesn't care if people are watching. You're grateful and thankful for what you have. You are to be grateful. It is your job to praise the Lord. It's important. It's important to be thankful. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We are to be thankful. We are to be thankful. I said earlier that I didn't know I was poor until junior high. I remember the summer, right before entering the sixth grade, I wanted cut off jean shorts. I mean, I'm telling you, you know the kind that like they were cut, but they were like folded toward, it was like a cuff. They were the coolest thing ever. All the cool kids had them. I wanted cuffed jean shorts so bad I couldn't see straight. Like it was the drive for me that whole summer. I drove my mother insane because I begged her all the time. I just need to, let me cut my jeans. Let me just cut my jeans. I won't buy a new one. I just want to cut my jeans. Well, I grew out of two pairs. When I mean grew out, like they were high waters. They were like up here. It wasn't purposely folded up. Like it was actually high waters. And so I lucked out because my mom's like, okay, we can't wear those. We have to go get you new jeans, so go ahead and cut those. Oh, it was on like Donkey Kong. I was so excited. I cut my jean shorts. I folded them. I even had my mama teach me how to iron so I can make it all look all pleated, all really nice, all flat and pretty. I was so excited to go to school that day. First day ever, had my jean shorts on. So excited because I was finally going to look like everybody else. It was awesome. I was like, I'm going to be the cool kid. No. Being from a poor house, I had absolutely no idea that the jean shorts they were wearing were actually designer jean shorts. They were stitched that way, y'all. They were stitched that way. I thought I was like, I mean, mind-blowing, excited, like I got the stuff. And they looked at me like I was a bug to be squished, you know. They looked at me like, to everybody else was totally obvious that I was white trash. That's what I was told. I actually didn't know until someone was so kind to point out how poor I was, how poor my family was, that we were actually white trash. That's what we were called. I didn't know that. I had no idea because I was blessed. I didn't feel those, you know, lacking, that lacking feeling. But I went home crying. I was very sad that day. And I wasn't sad because of being poor or white trash or whatever you want to call it. I was sad because of how I was treated. Because in my mind, I wasn't that. I was blessed. In my mind, my parents had done anything and everything to make us feel 
blessed. Psalm 37, 5 says, commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him, and he will help you. We are to be blessed. Years later, as an adult, I actually called my parents. This was back when we all had landlines, and so like everybody had like two or three phones that were landlines connected, and I called, my mom answered the phone. <clears throat> I'm like, Mommy, can you get Daddy on the phone? She's like, oh, all right, and she's yelling, Daddy, Sarah, wants you on the phone? So he gets on the other one, they're both on the phone, and I just was like, I don't know how you managed to parent me all those years, because I was crazy. You all were right. You probably didn't whoop me enough. But I told him, I am so thankful and grateful by how you treated me, by how you loved me, by how you constantly told me I was blessed. They were laughing hysterically when I told them they didn't whoop me enough. But um, I took the time to let them know that I was grateful for what they did for me. I was thankful for everything that I had. I believe in seeing, the, the, seeing life the way my parents taught us is why I'm blessed. I believe that being grateful and thankful equals blessed. We are to be content and grateful with what God gives us instead of complaining about everything we think that we're lacking, everything that we think that uh, we're not able to experience. We need to praise him for all that he does instead of questioning his design. Then you will receive the blessings he has laid out before you. God is not blocking your blessings. You are blocking your blessings. Not God. You are blocking them. Luke 4.30 says Jesus, who thanked and praised God, was teaching and was rejected in Nazareth. They mobbed him by moving him towards the cliff, intending to push him over. And he walked right through them. He was blessed. They were going to push him over, and he just walked right through them. <clears throat> we are to be grateful and thankful. Grateful and thankful equals blessed. Jesus was grateful and thankful towards his father, and it equaled a multitude of blessings. Exodus twenty three twenty five in the CEV says, Worship only me, the Lord your God. I will bless you with plenty of food and water and keep you strong. Deuteronomy thirty sixteen says, For I command you this day. I command you this day. Right now. Love the Lord your God and keep his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. When things don't go your way, thank God that his ways are greater than yours. Seriously. If someone else gets the promotion that you wanted, thank God that the right person got that job and there's a greater one waiting for you. Seriously. <laughs> If your pantry has started to look a little bare, thank the Lord, the Lord for supplying all your needs, for being your provider and your sustainer while the provisions are on their way. If your washing machine finally dies, thank the Lord for the soap and water that your hands can use in its place until the new one arrives. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I told you guys during Wednesday's word to praise him in the morning. 
Lord, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep today. I have to go to work. I am so tired. My eyeballs are having a hard time staying open. But thank you, Jesus, for my bed. It was so comfortable. Thank you for giving me a job that I get to go to that's paying my bills. Thank him through the day. Lord, I saw one mental health therapist patient after another. I have heard so many problems today. It is emotionally draining to hear one patient after another. But thank you, Lord, that I didn't bring that home with me, that I don't have those problems, that I have you in my life, and that does not come with. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping me in a sane state. Night. Lord, my son won't stop talking. It's time for bed. The kid won't go to sleep. I've told him 20 times, Jesus, to go to bed. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me my son, who is such a joy. I love him so much. He fills my, my house with laughter and excitement. Thank you for giving me a house to keep him safe and protected, for making sure that all of his worries are no longer there because he has a place to be that is safe for him. Praise him in the storm. Lord, my daddy died. Was that really the last time I was going to see my daddy? I wasn't done. I miss him. I want him, I wanted him to see Summer walk down the aisle. I wanted him to meet Levi. But Daddy died. Hallelujah, Jesus. He was saved a week before he died. Hallelujah, Jesus. He is in heaven. And I will see him again. I will get to see the experience he has had with you in heaven. I praise your holy name for giving me the opportunity to lead my daddy to Christ. So I get to see him again. Praise him in the joy. Summer got married. My baby found the man of her dreams. Lord, you provided the best man to love my sweet girl who showers her with affection, who treats her like the princess you designed her to be. Thank you, Jesus, for giving my baby a godly marriage that will last. This is what you are supposed to do. Not complain and whine and try to tell the Lord how he did something wrong. The word doesn't say to do it and then you see the blessings. He says, do it and you will receive the blessings. The word the Lord does not say after the blessings. He says, do it and you will receive the blessings. Praise, grateful, thankful, and then you will be blessed. Psalm 37, 3 through 5 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. We are to be grateful. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We are to be thankful. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. We will be blessed. This week, I have been praying Psalms one, one through three over you guys. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. 
but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they'll do. So before I close out this service, I actually want us to pray something together. I'm going to say some things, and I want you to repeat them as a commitment, as a devotion, as a covenant you're making with God again. I'm going to pray Psalms 103, 1 through 5. I'm going to say the words, and I want you to repeat them, knowing that you are literally making an out loud declaration to God of how you're going to choose to live for him. You can stand if you want. You can sit. It doesn't matter. I just want you to repeat. Father God, let all that I am praise you. With all my heart, I will praise your holy name. Let all that I am praise you. May I never forget the good things that you do for me. You forgive my sins, heal my diseases. You redeemed me from death. You crown me with love and tender mercies. You fill my life with good things. My youth is renewed like eagles. Father God, thank you for being here for us in every situation. We praise you in the morning. We praise you throughout the day. We praise you at night. We praise you in the storms and in the joy. Lord, I am grateful and thankful And I am blessed. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you do for us. Thank you for this congregation and how they're willing to open their heart to you, how they're willing to accept who they are in Christ and praise you for it. We praise your holy name. We praise the Holy Spirit. We praise Christ Jesus. It's in his name I pray these things. Amen. So before we close, I want to say a couple of things. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. I want to remind you that tonight at 6.30 is the pastoral panel. And Pastor David and I will be talking about some stuff at 6.30 on Facebook Live. So I want you to join into that. Tuesday, Pastor Mark will be doing Faith Talks at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live. Wednesday, I've got Wednesday's Word at 7 p.m., And once again, worship with word, 7 p.m. here at the church. I'm telling you, it was an experience like I have never experienced before. And there is a reason for that. The Lord gave me a message that I spoke with um, Stephen about and then ultimately Alicia about of what we were going to do today. We're going to do something a little bit different to close out the service As soon as I give the word, Pastor David is going to turn off Facebook Live. I'm going to close the doors. We're going to turn the lights down. The worship team is going to sing, and we're going to enter into a different kind of praise. So I want you, if you are having a moment with the Lord where you feel like you need to jump for joy because you are filled with joy, jump for joy. If you need to shout out in excitement, shout out in excitement. If you feel that you need to be on your face, get on your face. If you need to be at the altar on your knees, be on your knees. The point is, is this, this is your opportunity to be grateful and thankful for the Lord. This is going to be an intimate moment. And the reason we're going to turn off the video camera is because if we were a church of 700, nobody would notice, but we're not. And this is a very intimate thing that should be experienced in an intimate way. And so I'm going to honor everybody who's here to have their privacy. So we're going to turn that off. And anybody who's not willing to participate, it's okay. 
But I ask that you step out and go outside and not be in here because I want everybody who is in here to be able to have that privacy. So before they start playing, I'm going to tell you all that I hope that you have a very blessed day. We love you. We will see you soon. If you want to leave, now's the time to do it. I'm going to start closing everything up. Pastor David's going to turn off the camera. We love you, Facebook. Have a great day. If you were here, you're going to experience something different, but maybe next time you will. Next week, Pastor Mark and Pastor Donna are going to be here, and they're bringing some fire back with them as they preach together. Have a great day. Bye-bye now.